Good afternoon, and it is my pleasure on behalf of INTAC to welcome all of you to today's talk by Dr. Alka Tyagi. The talk on, and of course, a very, very warm and special welcome to our guest speaker, uh, Dr. Alka Tyagi. She will speak on Trika Shaivism of Kashmir, the non-dual tantric spiritual tradition with well-developed metaphysics. This ancient tantric religious tradition evolved into an impenetrable philosophical system with its own epistemology, metaphysics, and cosmogony while retaining logical assimilation of tantric ritual and spiritual paradigms under the Kashmiri Trika Trika scholars and spiritual masters like Somananda, Utpal Deva, Abhinav Gupta between the 9th and the 13th <coughs> centuries. My pleasure now to introduce Dr. Tyagi uh, formally. Dr. Alka Tyagi is an associate professor at the Department of English. Dayal Singh College, University of Delhi. But ladies and gentlemen, that is only her day job. Her actual interest and deep interest and passion in ancient Indian literature led her to study Sanskrit. And she's a scholar of ancient Indian literature in Sanskrit with specialized focus on Kashmiri Trika Shaivism Tantras, Upanishads, and Yogic Studies. She holds a doctoral degree from the School of Arts and Aesthetics, JNU, on devotional studies in medieval India. Her publications include From Feminity to Divinity, Reconstructing Narda Bhakti Sutras, Whispers Whispers at the Ganga Ghat, Amal Tas, and so on. As a writer, she contributes to the Hindu and Indian literature, the, uh, the Sahitya Academy Literary Journal. Her academic trajectory encompasses a fellowship at the Indian Institute of Advanced Studies Simla, where she has contributed to the Institute's research activities and advanced her research project, Bhavna, Creative Contemplation and Bhairava, Supreme Reality in Trika Philosophy. She's also initiated into the Satyananda Yoga tradition. And now, without much ado, Alka, over to you. Thank you, dear Manisha and uh, INTAC uh, for this wonderful evening. I'm grateful for the platform that INTAC has extended to me. Uh, Trikashaivism is a complex integration of religion, spirituality, tantras. So I'm trying to put in a lot into this hour. So excuse me if I become too dense. We will speak today on Trikashaivism as a metaphysics, as a religion, and as a spiritual tradition in three different sections. Nami Chit Pratibham Devim Param Bhairava Yoginim Matriman Prameyansha Shulam Buj Kritas Padam. I bow to that supreme para energy, the light of consciousness, which is one with Bhairava and which is established on the lotus trident of subject, object, and means of knowledge. So, although the entire vocabulary of today's lecture will be drawing upon the terminology that is, that is already established in the tradition, but 
my dear friends the underlining factor of the entire talk would would be to make you aware of subject object and the means of perception that is para para apara and the apara energies so in order not to deviate too much i will stick to this paper so that we hold on to the time documentation of tantra scriptures began in early 9th century kashmir shaiva tantras are grouped into three categories according to their philosophical stance on nature of reality so we have rudra tantras which are completely dual we have shaiva tantras we have rudra tantras which are dualistic shaiva tantras which are dual come non dual and bhairava tantras which are absolutely non dual in their stance on reality here we are concerned with bhairava tantras only because it is within the bhairava tantras that the trika tantras emerge the swachhanda bhairava siddha yogeshwari mata jayadrath yamal Malini Vijayotar, along with the famous Vijnana Bhairava Tantra, are some of the Bhairava Tantras which are which form the scriptural scriptural base for the Trika Tantras. Trika, literally, triad. It is so called because it relates to a group of three. The original triad of Pati, Pashu, and Pasha. from the pashupata religion eventually evolved into three shaktis of para the supreme para apara the middle one and apara the lower one which is related to the object objective world they correspond to the subject object and means of knowledge in fact kashmiri trika shaiva tantras evolved as a symphony of thought and practice that unfolds not only religion but also metaphysics spirituality aesthetics and dramaturgy in its fold in the hands of sage scholars of kashmir from 9th to 11th centuries in this lecture we shall look into kashmiri trika shaivism as a tantric shaiva religion as a metaphysics of absolute consciousness and as a spiritual experience of spanda the cosmic pulsation in separate sections as a religion trika shaivism has its origin in the ancient pashupata religion as a philosophy it is exposited as pratyabhigya the doctrine of recognition as a spiritual experience it is explained as spanda the doctrine of vibration we will look into these as we go along so first i take up trika shaivism as a tantric religion tantric traditions arose in response to notions of excessive purity and prescribed bounds of ashram chatushtaya in the vedic system of life the word tantra relates to sanskrit verb root tanu vistare and it also relates to tanoti and trayate so tantra can be explained as tanoti means that which expands and trayate means that which liberates so tantra would mean that which expands the consciousness and liberates it from the limitations of our human existence in a wider sense tantras would refer to methods means and techniques that are spread out in the tantric literature which lead to liberation of consciousness and its expansion 
traditionally the word tantra is used interchangeably with agama agama as the word suggests that which comes that which comes down from maheshwar through the guru guru shishya lineage to us so it is uh, it is uh, defined as agamo naam a maheshwarat guru parampara agatam shastram that shastra that discipline which comes to us through mainly the emphasis is on it comes to us from within the tradition lineage first tantrics were male brahmin ascetics who were not merely liberation seekers but were seekers of siddhis spiritual powers they resisted the sequential journey through four phases of vedic existence that is brahmacharya grihastha vanaprastha and sanyasa they took a leap over the ashrama system and hence they were called atyashramis one who transcends the ashramas as opposed to the vedic idea of pure and sacred they considered nothing as impure or profane they often lived at the periphery of mainstream habitats and were shunned by the civilized the tantric adepts took extreme ascetic vows they performed sadhana in cremation grounds ate from the skull bowl procured from the corpses wore cremation ashes for clothes kept a scepter and earrings of human bones as insignia the kapalikas and kalamukhas of the medieval uh, south india they are the sects which have their antecedents in this uh, in this ati ashrami <coughs> ascetic orders these ati ashrami although they branched away from the vedas they associated themselves with the vedic deity rudra rudra shiva and slowly they associated rudra with auspiciousness with epithets like shankara shambhu shiva the shankara shankaroti iti shankara sham means that who is peaceful and contented and is auspicious so shankara rudra became shiva and shankar this was to ascertain that the contraries of good bad profane sacred terrifying appealing auspicious in auspicious are scaled equal on the substratum of consciousness and here this consciousness is named as shiva these ascetics embraced everything that was unacceptable to the mainstream vedic shrota and smarta ritual traditions they created their own ritual pool that was transgressive and complex like the panchamakar sadhana with five m's of madhya mans matsya mudra and maithuna these tantric disciplines were followed exclusively by ascetics they were not for householders and they worked under the ati marga until 5th century ad later there was a need for the householders to be integrated because they were genuine seekers within within the uh, within the grihastha ashram so to integrate the householders from ati marga of these ascetics who were ati ashramis evolved the mantra marga so offshoot of ati marga is mantra marga the path of mantra which integrated householders who were serious seekers major tantras within the mantra marga with 10 rudragamas 18 shaivagamas and 64 bhairavagamas uh, evolved under the mantra marga in the first two sects that is uh, shaivagamas and rudragamas the shakti the feminine principle was completely absent it was in the bhairava agamas that shakti slowly took dominance shakti was integrated and eventually when 
by the time we come to Trika from the Bhairava Agamas, the Shakti is completely dominating over the Bhairava, over the Supreme Being. So they are, basically they say that uh, Trika is Shakta in practice, but in philosophy it is Shaiva. So, so although it is Trika Shaivism, actually it is Shakta in practice. So the Bhairava Agamas integrated feminine principle and according to the degree of integration of Shakti, these Agamas are further differentiated into Yamala, Yogini and Trika Tantras. We are concerned of course with the Trika Tantras which develop particularly in the land of Kashmir. Trika Tantric Shaivism is very different from Puranic Shaivism in the sense that it is completely initiatory in nature. While the Puranic Shaivism is free for all. So only the, in the Tantric tradition, Diksha is the prerequisite. Only the initiate who has been given Diksha is the competent Adhikari to the path of Shaiva Sadhana. The antinomian practices that we just mentioned, like Adi Yaga, the primal union, and the ritual intercourse, these are methodical boundaries that tantric cohorts build in order to guard their teachings and practices, which are certainly not for the uninitiated. However, however if one looks at their scriptural material, the tantras also, like any other religion, offer a very sound religious framework with refined ideas of creator, process of creation, and the place of individual in this religious framework. Tantric Shaiva religion gives a very advanced idea of God with also a four-dimensional religious uh, framework. Uh, they integrate the uh, existing symbolism of Rudra Shiva to a supreme God who is completely made up of energy, Shakti. They remold the God or Supreme Being and they call it nothing but Shakti and they say that God's very body is made up of energy, Shakti and that's why we have these Pancha Brahma Mantras in the Pashupata Sutras which I'll come to that. So Pashupata Sutras mention Pancha Brahma Mantras with five aspects of Rudra Shiva. These are mantras which denote uh, faces of Sadyojat, Vamadev, Aghor, Ishan and Tatpurush. And with the power encapsulated in the mantras, these faces, they execute fivefold act of creation, that is Sthiti, Sthiti, sorry, Shrishti, Sthiti, Samhar and uh, Tirodhan and Anugraha. In English, it would be uh, creation, preservation, withdrawal, grace of revelation and grace of concealment. We have five krityas in the Trika religions as opposed to the three krityas in the Vedanta. The religious tenets are also very clearly laid out. So we have the four uh, categories of Vidya, uh, Kriya, uh, Yoga and Charya. So in Vidya one, that is knowledge, one comes to know about what is knowledge, knowledge about the supreme that needs to be pursued in order to get liberation from the cycles of pain and death and uh, pain and joy and death and, uh, death and birth. And uh, in the Kriya aspect, the rituals and uh, rituals like Diksha and other rituals are described. In the Charya aspect and Yoga aspect, in the Yoga aspect, they talk about the spiritual practices that that lead to the path, uh, lead you on to the path of uh, 
taken path of Tantra Sadhana. The Charya aspect is very interesting because in the Charya they have rules of behavior for the initiate, for the ad Tantric adept. The rules are very interesting because they, uh, some of you might be aware that you know the tantric adept was supposed to live at the, the periphery of the social bounds and they were supposed to be extremely absurd in their behavior as well as in their uh, external appearance. So they would do the huddu car and they would like take their tongue out and, uh, and shout at, uh, at the ordinary people if they came, come acro came across them. As I said, these were their ways to protect the, their own practice, to protect uh, themselves from the onslaught of the mainstream ideas of profane and sacred, pap and punya. So Trikal Shaivism maintains these tenets as a religion. But it rises above the stereotypes of uh, religi uh, religious framework by developing the, the idea of Shakti as Shiva's power. And this Shakti touches each aspect of existence so that there is nothing which is not Shakti and in turn there is nothing that is not Shiva. So there is no soteriology or doctrine of salvation in Trikka Shaivism because there is nothing outside of Shiva, the absolute consciousness, so there is nothing to get liberated from. Trikka believes that samsara or creation is expansion of consciousness through the means of Shakti and samhara or dissolution of creation is Shakti's repose into Shiva consciousness. <coughs> so this is just a table to which I have already talked about, gives you a little history. We are talking about Trika as a tantric religion right now. So in Trika, Trika Tantras, we also had Kala and Krama Tantras. Kala schools involved the orgiastic worship of Kula, the Shakti, which also involved ritual intercourse and offering of sexual fluids, wine, meat, etc. in the worship. Krama schools involved worship of Kali, as power of supreme consciousness. Acharya Abhinav Gupta assimilated the Kala and the Krama Matas, Krama schools into Trika and he further developed it, it into Anuttara Trika Kula. And that he accomplishes in his compendium of Tantras, the Tantra Lok. He does not undermine the significance of ritual and their symbolism. In fact, after chapter 15th of Tantra Loka, the, there is very elaborate documentation of tantric rituals in the Tantra Loka. And chapter 29 contains the extended explanation of Adi Yaga, the primal union, uh, ritual intercourse, which is done as a worship to lift the awareness. In Trika, you know what happens in Trika, the ritual which is uh, and that's what that is the uh, contribution of Acharyas like Somananda, Utpaladeva and especially Acharya Abhinav Gupta because Acharya Abhinav Gupta while maintaining the sanctity of the ancient rituals, he assimilates it into the base of consciousness. So the Ritual, external ritual becomes a, a thread for realization in the inner consciousness. So in Trika, ritual came to be understood as an inner process of realization through which the initiate 
discovered his essential identity with the power of consciousness through polarities of subject, object, and means of knowledge, which are all having the same substratum, that is consciousness. The experience of this process, coupled with the arousing of man's spiritual potential, uh, that is rising of Kundalini, and the expansion of consciousness that it brings about, it is the most esoteric practice of Kashmiri Shaivism. The Kala character within the Trika is evidenced by the fact that the Trika advocates ritual consumption of wine and uh, meat and ritual intercourse as a possible means for developing consciousness. So this was about religion uh, as a tantric, Trika Shaivism as a tantric religion with a framework, with an idea of a god and with the, the way the creation is executed by the five faces of Shiva. These tenets are maintained by the Trika, but Trika takes a takes a huge leap into the paradigm where consciousness is all. If it is subject, object and means of perception, it is one thread of consciousness. Because the entire existence is works along these three coordinates, hence the trika. Now I'll uh, move on to trika as a metaphysics. So just as uh, As a metaphysics, Trika is explained through the concept of Pratyabhigna, Pratyabhigya, Pratyabhigna or Pratyabhigya as you like to pronounce, you may choose that. Pratyabhigya literally means recognition, or recognition, recognition in a way that it is like a flash of insight when you look at something, when you know something already, but now when you look at it, you recognize it in its fullness. So Pratyabhigya would mean coming back to that which is already known and knowing it fully, knowing it in its fullness. So that's why Acharya Utpaladeva says that Maheshwar is Adi Siddha. But then he gives the entire reasoning in his Ishwar Pratibhigya Karikas like to explain rationally how the Pratibhigya works, how the recognition is re-perceiving something and then knowing it again. The doctrine of uh, the, ph the philosophy is Pratibhigya and the experience is explained through Spanda. Now these two doctrines, they do not come directly from revealed scriptures from the Agamas, but they are also developed by uh, within the Guru Shishya lineage uh, and hence they belong to the Trika tradition which was developed by the uh, Kashmiri Shaivacharyas again uh, in their most fertile period which was from 9th to 11th century and also extended through uh, Acharyas like, uh, like uh, Jayaratha who, uh, who from whose commentary we understand Tantra Loka. When we come, when we talk about metaphysics in Indian spiritual systems basically we talk about reality principles, the tattvas and Sankhya talks about these tattvas are nothing but like the levels of creation and we, most of you would be aware of the Sankhya which, uh, which gives 25, it talks about 25 tattvas from Purusha down to Prithvi in that Krama. And the, the, these 25 tattvas have been accepted by almost all uh, of uh, Indian philosophical systems except for Shaiva Siddhantins and of course Trika. So both Shaiva Siddhantins and the Trika uh, Shaivites, they add 
eleven more reality principles to talk about their non-dualism, to talk about reality from non-dual perspective, to explain the non-duality of the uh, of the nature of reality, nature of creation. So, the eleven tattvas that they add, of course, the twenty-five tattvas. Yeah. The 25 tattvas, just to enumerate them quickly, are uh, Purusha, Prakriti, Mahat, and uh, Manas, and th five Tanmatras, and um, five, uh, five sense organs, five uh, organs of action, and then five um, gross elements, and then, and uh, yes, so these are 25. Trika philosophers add, very interestingly, Maya as Shakti. So Maya is not illusion here, but it is, and literally Maya means that which measures. It comes from the verb root Maya. So the one who measures is Maya. One who, and measuring means limiting. So Maya comes with its five kanchukas, five layers, five appendages, uh, which are which are the limiting factors. And Maya brings in these limiting factors, which are uh, Kala, Vidya, Rag, Kala, and Niyati. And just to give them quick uh, translation, Kala is creativity. So while the absolute consciousness has full creativity, Kala limits that creativity, and Vidya limits the full knowledge, Raga limits the full capacity to love, Kala, time, limits our capacity to be in all times. So like we are bound by time. Then Niyati is space, all pervasiveness. So that limits the all pervasiveness of Shiva. And then with Maya's appendages, the individual Purusha or individual experient is formed. So they add to Maya with five appendages and above that, there are um, five more tattvas. And these are very interesting because although their names are taken from the religious vocabulary, but if you look at the metaphysical explanation, and Alokji is here for his sake, he was in my mind all the time that I must explain the, the metaphysical part of it. So Alokji, we have five further five reality principles which are above the Maya. And these are like Maya is bringing down the, uh, pos positing the limitations and making the individual experience. But above Maya, how we proceed up to Shiva. So above Maya is the state of what is called Shuddha Vidya, which is pure perception. So if the Maya is dropped, then the person Purity of perception means clarity of perception means expansion of perception happens. And then there is Ishwara above Shuddha Vidya. Ishwara is objective self-reflection. The ability to say, this am I. Then there is above the Ishwara, there is Sada Shiva and that is subjective self-reflection where the, the, uh, the consciousness says, I am this like looking at itself still like in subjective uh, perspective. And then from uh, Sada Shiva, above Sada Shiva is Shakti, which is power of exuberance, power of fullness. And there it is just exuberance. It is complete like energy. And then above Shakti, above or like, you know, th this is we, we are speaking in a Krama, but existence is a Krama. Basically, there is no sequence. It's like a pulsation. But then above Shakti is Shiva. And Shiva is absolute consciousness. You may say Purna Aham, full consciousness. So this is how then uh, they add 11 tattvas to talk about how everything is basically consciousness. But consciousness is veiling itself objectifying ips itself through Shakti. So you can imagine a full circle and you can then imagine how out of its own exuberance, out of its own uh, Swatantriya, out 
gift of its own ichcha shakti kriya shakti and jnana shakti it creates the differentiated world in which every level of reality is actually has this underlying shiva consciousness because it is within that consciousness that the the phenomena are rising and falling the objectivity is falling and rising so the entire range of manifest creation is an unfoldment of different levels of reality which bet between the shiva tattva and the prithvi tattva so they say that the each reality level is consciousness has shiva consciousness nasa avastha yana shiva no reality is outside of shiva which is named as consciousness here and shakti is the means to experience that now very interestingly trika says that each reality level is consciousness of course but to the extent to which expansion of shak power has happened in that level so it is shiva to that extent to which shakti has expanded in on that level and each reality level has potential to expand its shakti to the fullness and it can recognize its shivahood even a stone can realize its shivahood so they they uh, the shaiva masters argue that true nature of reality is non dual by maintaining that the material existence with its appearance and disappearance is a constant rising and falling within one absolute consciousness an individual being also experiences objective world within his or her own own consciousness the substratum of which is the unified field of absolute consciousness itself Acharya Abhinav Gupta explains the non-dual nature of creation using the metaphor of a mirror in his Parmarth Sar, and I quote: "Darpan bimbe yadvan nagar grama di chitra ma vibhagi bhati vibhage ne vacha parasparam darpana da picha vimalatam param bhairav bodha tadvat vibhag shunyam api." अन्योन्यम च ततोपि च विभक्तम आभाति जगदेत जस्ट एज द वेरियस ऑब्जेक्ट्स लाइक सिटी विलेज एट्सेट्रा रिफ्लेक्टेड ऑन द सर्फेस ऑफ मिरर अपीयर टू बी सेपरेट फ्रॉम ईच अदर एज वेल एज फ्रॉम द मिरर इन द सेम वे द मोस्ट प्योर अवेयरनेस ऑफ पर भैरव in that awareness the diverse objects of the universe shine as if they are separate from each other and also from that bhairava this absolute consciousness come back to the terminology of metaphysics it is explained as luminous prakash luminousness prakasha in the sense of jnana also in the sense of cognition also so prakasha has two meanings uh, one is its luminosity which gives it the power to shine and make manifest make things visible in a way so that luminosity and cognition to recognize this is prakasha and the ability of this consciousness to cognize itself to look at itself to self reflect is vimarsha so prakash and vimarsha then they are connected with shiva and shakti because the acharyas maintain the religious terminology there was no need to become secular in those times so they did not feel the need to explain that you know you can look at it scientifically you can look at it completely secularly you can look at it in the term terminology of 
which does not uh, involve the religious terminology. So you, if you choose that, you may choose that, but Shaiva masters did not. So they always talked about, and there is so much poetry in the tantras, Shiva and Shakti. That is the world. Shakti is the expansion into the diverse phenomena, and Shiva is the repose into which Shakti sleeps. I must uh, look at time. <clears throat> now the the what we were addressing up till now were the reality principles so the metaphysics of uh, trikashaivism how they talk about the levels of creation how the creation unfolds but now we can we want to talk about what is the proof of the consciousness because all the indian uh, spiritual philosophical systems all of them are philosophical system, the six systems, and they really give us the vocabulary to uh, not only religious vocabulary, they give us the vocabulary of logic and reason, uh, and they give us uh, how to ex what proof we can use. Each system has pramana, and uh, trika has its pramana, and that pramana is pratyabhigya. They say that pratyabhigya is ex can be it is swasamvid it can be experienced very uh, in everyday life it can be experienced very quickly so i'll rather read so the by what means by what proof by what reasoning can one experience the absolute consciousness shiva so the philosophical systems Although they emphasize upon realized knowledge, they also give logical reasoning and verbal experience for that realized knowledge. Trika philosophy uh, talks about idea of pratibhigya. As I said, it is recognition in a flash of insight about of something which is already known, so that it now can be fully realized. So in in trika. Pratibhigya comes to denote recognition of ourselves in our unveiled, complete nature, which is termed as absolute Shiva consciousness. And that's why Shiva Sutras declare Chaitanyam Atma. The universal consciousness is identical with the self, with the Atma. Acharya Somananda basically sowed the seeds of Pratibhigya in his Shiva Drishti uh, in order to counter the uh, existing Hindu schools and, uh, and talk about how every perception in creation actually happens on the same field of consciousness. So he was just countering the dual schools, but his disciple later Acharya Utpaladeva brought a new dimension to dimension to Pratyabhigya when he underlined the Pratyabhigya in a new light by, by showing us that Pratyabhigya is nothing but the ability of the consciousness to cognize itself. Consciousness had the, has the ability to cognize itself. This is what Acharya Utpal Deva's contribution is within the Trika lineage. So, then only you can say that reality is non-dual because it is happening on the consciousness and consciousness is cognizing itself and every cognition, every perception is rise of a phenomena, rise of, a, of objective uh, reality. Because only when you uh, objectify do you create. I look at I look at her, so I create her. Otherwise, she is not in my frame, in my consciousness at all. So that is non-duality. That everything is happening in your own consciousness, and it is macrocosmic consciousness is completely identical with the macrocosmic universal consciousness.
<clears throat> so pratibhigya is the recognition to perceive the underlying shiva nature in the self and the universe in our common experience small recognitions small pratibhigyas are taking place all the time our routine existence is impossible without these recognitions so consider memory the very process of memory is a part of recognition process of memory suggests a continuum of recognizable perceptions which are located on a common substratum the ability to perceive that substratum of all perceptions including memory that is the highest recognition highest pratibhigya and which is the goal of trika shaiva tantric adept vigyana bhairava tantra which which is a very ancient tantra but was integrated by trika masters into trika fold it has a verse which i quote here grahaya grahak samvitti samanya sarva dehi naam yogi naam tu visheshu asti sambandhe savadhanata though there is general awareness about subject and object in all individuals but the yogis pay special attention to the relation between subject and object subjectivity and objectivity savadhanata literally means attentiveness with attention by paying attention pratibhigya happens and expands the pratibhigya is a method and it's also a proof a pramana of the underlying substratum of consciousness more importantly it is something as simple as a flood of joy that you feel in your heart when you see a beloved one and sometimes in the absence of the beloved one you still feel that joy where is it coming from it was within so the joy has its source in that consciousness not outside and i have quoted alama iqbal here and uh, because the poet in me wants to talk to you jinhe main dhoonta tha aasmano mein zameeno mein wo nikle mere zulmate khanaye dil ke makino mein now this pratibhigya recognition of one's own consciousness as supreme consciousness can take place in three ways swatah gurutah shastratah if the level of awareness is very high the adept experiences his own self as universal consciousness on his own and anything can be a stimulus a beautiful face a flower a raindrop anything if adept's awareness is mediocre then guru channels the energy through techniques that are that are guarded and given only within the lineage thirdly the seeker can take resort to the textual discipline offered in the scriptures of the tradition now we here we finish the topic of pratyabhigya it's like saying too much uh, in too little time and that way saying actually nothing so you may look at the paper later and if you are interested in pratyabhigya then you may read uh, uh, my uh, my teacher and my revered master uh, professor navjeevan rastogi's essay on pratyabhigya kashmir shaiv darshan um, mein uh, प्रतिमान प्रतिमानक के रूप में प्रतिभिज्ञा की भूमिका आई हैव फिफ्टीन मिनट्स एंड आई वॉन्ट टू टॉक अबाउट स्पंद द एक्सपीरियंस पार्ट नाउ सो जस्ट एज द डॉक्ट्रिन ऑफ प्रतिभिज्ञा रिकग्निशन इज एक्सप्लेनिंग द फिलोसॉफिकल एस्पेक्ट ऑफ त्रिक शैविज्म the spanda doctrine talks about the experience part so how do we experience the pratyabhigya what is the nature of that experience this is given in the spanda so so samhar and sansar or sansar and samhar creation and dissolution 
are explained as Spanda, the rhythmic pulsation in Shiva consciousness. And Pratyabhigya of Spanda, recognition of vibration, this cosmic pulsation, that is the ultimate experience in Trika. So we undergo general recognitions that make our daily life possible, general pratibhigyas, general realizations, uh, and they connect our you know life, day-to-day uh, -day life from each day to the other. So there, there is this within these underlying these small vibrations is the underlying these small recognitions is the larger pratibhigya that everything is actually ha happening on a continuous unified field of consciousness wo badi pratibhigya hai choti choti pratibhigyaon se roz ka jeevan banta hai aur wo jo constant search hai jisko uski awareness hai wo wo search kahan ho rahi hai that is happening on a bigger uh, or or i must say a wider scale of consciousness <coughs> so along the same lines from experience perspective uh, these small recognitions are experienced as rhythm of life as vishesh spandas and the and the they and the universal pulse, pulsation is known as samanya spanda this samanya spanda is the underlying eternally active rhythm of rise and fall of all phenomena and span in spanda karika the very first words and i quote yasya unmesh nimesh abhyam jagatah pralayo udayo tam shakti chakra vibhava prabhavam shankaram stumaha we praise shankara the source of collective wheel of glorious energies by the opening and closing of whose eyelids the world appears and goes into dissolution this stanza uses analogy of rhythm behind opening and closing of eyes to depict spanda the term spanda literally means movementless movement kinchit chalane what is important here is to note that just as opening of eyes reaches culmination the process of closing begins yugpat simultaneously just as creation reaches its culmination the process of dissolution begins yugpat simultaneously this is the constant rhythm of dynamic conscious cosmic consciousness now kshem raja in his commentary to this particular verse of aspanda karika brilliantly assimilates aspects of rhythmic bliss of shiva and shakti's primal union the adi yaga replicated in the union of contraries that are essential for process of creation for any process of creation contraries are necessary union of contraries is necessary so man and woman feminine and masculine era and pingala energies in the yogi's subtle body in breath out breath silence rise of speech repose movement deep sleep wakefulness all merge into the contraries of creation and dissolution in the macrocosm but what is important is the space time in between so if you want to experience the spanda you can experience it from stationing yourself in the middle of contraries and although the i have only 3 minutes now i'll uh, come to the conclusion the practice part is not this in the scope of this paper uh, but i must touch upon one verse from kshem raja's pratibhigya hridayam that that underlines a uh, four practices only and which perhaps are are the essence of trika practices so i quote and uh, kshem raja says that madhya vikasa chidanand labha by expansion of the madhya the center the point that i talked about the time space between the contraries by expansion of that does we get the labha of chida we obtain the chidananda 
bliss of absolute consciousness. The practices that I talked about and one verse from Pratipigya Hridayam uh, underlines all the practices. This is Vikalpakshaya Shakti Sankoch Vikas Vaha Chedan Adi Antakoti Nibhalan. Iho Upaya. These are the Upayas. So, cessation of thought constructs, contraction and expansion of prana shakti, cessation of flow of prana like we do in kumbhak or by uttering anachaka sounds, vowelless sounds, and adya anta koti nibhalan, perception of the breath at the points where it begins at the heart center and the dvadashanta, the external uh, point where it ends. Last and last paragraph I'll read and then I'll finish. <coughs> so if we notice the emphasis in each practices I practice is on holding on to the in-between space time. For instance, in the first practice, cessation of thoughts take place when the yogi catches the point where one thought ends and other begins. In the second uh, practice, Shakti Sankoch Vikas. The contraction and unfoldment of Shakti denotes the simultaneous withdrawal of vital energy that goes into, goes out into the senses and turning it within as the sense organs are left silent. So it is best explained in Bhairavi Mudra which, which is like Antar Laksha Bahir Drishti. While the yogi is, his eyes are open, your eyes are open but your awareness is turned inwards. You see everything in diversity, in all its diversity, but you perceive nothing but the underlying uniform consciousness. The entire world is in front of you, but your energy is, Shakti is turned within to its source inside you. You are centered. Thank you very much for uh, thank you, Alka. We usually have a, a very brief question answer session, but uh, we have um, exceeded the uh, time limit. So uh, maybe we can have two questions. If anybody has any questions to ask, we could probably take two questions. Yes, please. Please wait for the mic because it's getting recorded. Yeah, when you talk about Swata, what you, can you elaborate a little more about that? Namaste, Ramanji. Uh, Swata, as we believe in Punar Janma, so we say that the work has been done in the previous Janmas and anything can just stimulate the awareness to a different paradigm, like happened to Maharishi, uh, 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 Ramana Maharishi, like to uh, the Kali, Dakshineshwar Kali ke Hamare, Ramakrishna Paramhansa, and to many, many yogis. It can ha actually, it happens to all of us also, but we don't recognize. Swata is a quick shift of paradigm by anything. It can be the face of your daughter. It can be any beautiful girl or flower or a taste. Any sense can stimulate that shift. Swata. Yes, ma'am. Shekhar ji, yaan dije mic. This is quite fascinating. So Shiva himself is consciousness and not Brahman? So Brahma, uh, word Brahma actually, Brahma, Brahman, Brahman, Brahman. 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 Hmm. the word Brahman means expansion. So it, they use Panja Brahma mantras to denote the five faces of Shiva. So Brahman, if you do not go to Vedanta, Brahma of Vedanta, then Brahman is Shiva also. <laughs> And consciousness is Brahman also that way. Because Brahman is a concept as well as a deity in the 
Brahma is a deity. Ha, that's what yeah. I'm saying. But Brahman. The, Brahman is exactly you. Uh, it's the concept. Brahman is the concept, which means expansion, total expansion. That means, and it relates to consciousness, expansion of the entire creation. That is Brahman, and that way it is Shiva. Because Shiva comes with gunas. With so Brahman is ma'am. We do sorry, ma'am. Sorry to cut you in. We don't really have time for a an expanded discussion. One one last question. I'll be I'll be very very honest. All this is brutally and very complex and very difficult for us to understand. And if it is so diff not us, I mean me. Um, and if it is so difficult for me to understand, I'm just trying to ask, I'm just trying to figure in my own mind, is there anything, any way that we can translate this into more simpler language? Is there any book, is there any effort made? And at least pass on this deep knowledge, and I know I acknowledge it's very deep. It's uh, this deep spiritual knowledge to our children so that as they grow up, they appreciate and they understand the value of, of the, 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 the Hindu religion that we, that we have been born in. There is, no, there is no book. I, for one, did not learn all this in my younger days. Uh, uh, and I think uh, it is about time that we look at educating our children. But it can only happen if it's simplified. That's a comment or a question, I don't know. Sir, thank you very much. It's my deep desire to simplify. And my friend Sopan Joshi ji is here. He was also saying the same thing, that this will go waste on. So I have failed. <laughs> it's clear. Uh, uh, but uh, but <laughs> uh, sir, uh, it's a very relevant question. Uh, I what comes to my mind is that an ounce of practice is worth more than a thousand books. So I think we should teach our children little, perhaps, you know, some practice. And yogic practice is very simple. That's where I began. And automatically, the experiences started unfolding and the journey began. So very simple practices. If we teach our children, they will, their brain centers will open. So I somehow feel that it's opening the entire brain system that is like full consciousness. And that happens. We have tools, sir. We have tools like from eight onwards, you can teach them Surya Namaskar, Gayatri Mantra. Gayatri Mantra is called Buddhi Vivardhan Mantra. Like it touches those brain centers which expand your buddhi. So um, I think that's right now. But I'll also try to, you know, make it simpler <laughs> in my next uh, writing. Thank you. Thank you, Alka. Uh, may I now invite Chairman Intact Major General L.K. Gupta to please present a token of appreciation to Alka for a very, very complex uh, talk. Dr. Mishra, she's member secretary in TAC. Sir, in fact, um, uh, what you said, you've actually taken my lines and my uh, words for the <laughs> wrap-up session. But uh, anyway, um, Alka, we understand that uh, Trichachevism of Kashmir is an extremely complex, complicated, deep philosophy which probably requires uh, years and years of study to kind of uh, absorb 
what it says in its, its, in its most uh, comprehensive form. But what I do hope that what your talk has done, personally for me, and I hope also for the members of the audience, is that it has demystified at least the introduction to the philosophy a bit. And then, of course, rest is to our own curiosity and scholarship. So thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for coming. May I invite you for a cup of tea outside?